Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 13th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, can I, I welcome all our witnesses who we'll uh, introduce in a moment. Um, can I uh, also uh, welcome, uh, joining us in the gallery, we have a delegation from Poland who are visiting Scotland to find out more about our energy successes and challenges. So welcome to you all. I hope you uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy the proceedings and find them of interest. Can I remind everyone, please, if they can turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with sound equipment. Right, item one uh, on the agenda. Uh, can I ask if members uh, are uh, agreed that we take item five in private? Agreed. Was agreed, thank you. And can I also ask if members are agreed uh, that uh, future reviews of evidence heard in connection with the security of supply inquiry should be done in private? Is that agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Item two on the agenda. Um, Next week, we will be considering our draft annual report as a committee. Our members agreed that that will be taken in private. Agreed. As agreed. Thank you. And item three on the agenda, in relation to our current inquiry on security of supply, uh, our members are content to delegate to the convener responsibility for arranging for the SPCB to pay, under Rule 12.4.3, any expenses of witnesses to the inquiry. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, as agreed. Thank you. Right, item four, uh, we are now taking evidence uh, in relation to our security of supply inquiry in round table format. Now, given the number of people here, I think the easiest thing to do is if we just go around the table and all introduce ourselves and say who we are. So I'll start. My name is Murdo Fraser. I am a member of the Scottish Parliament for Mid-Scotland and Fife, and I'm the committee convener. And I'll hand over to Gareth. Uh, I'm Gareth Harrison. I'm Professor of Power Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, good morning, I'm Dennis Robertson, I'm the MSP for Aberdeenshire West and I'm the Deputy Convener for the Committee. I'm Colin McInnes, I'm the James Watt Chair, Professor of Engineering Science at the University of Glasgow. Chick Brody, uh, SNP MSP for our own of them, for the south of Scotland. Uh, morning everyone, I'm Keith Bell, I'm from the University of Strathclyde, I hold the um, Chair in Smart Grid Technologies, which is supported by Scottish Power and I'm also a Co-Director of the UK Energy Research Centre. Gordon MacDonald, SNP MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. Uh, Alan Walker, I'm Head of Policy at the Royal Academy of Engineering. Richard Lyle, SNP MSP Central Region. Uh, Ian Arden, I'm uh, re representing an institution of mechanical engineers and lead author of uh, several recent reports, which uh, uh, I know many of you have seen. Thank you. Lewis MacDonald, Labour MSP, North East Scotland. Michael Riley, I'm Senior Policy Manager for Grid and Markets at Scottish Renewables. Joanne Lamont, MSP for Labour MSP for Glasgow Pollock. I'm Dr Edward Owens from Harry Watt University. I run several large uh, European research projects on demand side management and microgrids. Patrick Harvey, Green MSP for Glasgow. Hi, uh, Brian Galloway, I'm the Energy Policy Director at Scottish Power. Joan McAlpine, SNP MSP for the South of Scotland. Lawrence Slade, Interim Chief Executive for Energy UK. Thank you all. I should also say we have the official reporters here who are noting everything you say. Um, that should not be seen in any sinister way, but simply we keep a record of uh, what is being said. And we're also joined by uh, Alistair Reid, uh, who's uh, lead researcher in the Scottish Parliament Information Service uh, on uh, Energy, and Roger Evans, who's Senior Assistant Clerk. So thank you all for coming. Now, um, the way we're going to run this this morning is we've got, uh, well, we schedule 90 minutes. I think, I think um, if the witnesses can accommodate us, I think, and given the number of witnesses we have, I think if we can run it till about 12 o'clock, we will do that if that's convenient. But we need to finish sharp at 12 because there's other business we need to, to address. So, so a maximum of two hours. Um, clearly, there are a lot, a lot of people here uh, to give a view, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, if you all try and address every single question, it's going to take an awful lot of time to get anywhere. So, so I, have, I have the job of chairing this. What I will do is, if, if members have a question, I would ask them if they could direct it initially, perhaps to one particular individual. And then I would say, if you uh, agree uh, strongly with a view you've heard, or perhaps even more importantly, disagree strongly with a view you've heard, if you catch my eye and come in at that point, and I will try, if you catch my eye, to bring people in, as best as I can, and you know, we're, we're keen to hear a range of different views. We don't want to hear you necessarily 
all agreeing with each other. Um, although maybe you will. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe unlikely, says the deputy computer. Um, so we want to hear a range of views, but, but uh, I'll catch my eye and I'll bring you in as best I can. Now, um, I thought I would just start off and maybe just go round all our witnesses, just and give you all uh, just a, a minute or two each, and I'll start with you, uh, Gareth, seeing as you're handy, um, beside me on this one. I'm just going to witnesses, and maybe just ask you, just in a few sentences, to, to answer this question, which really is the key question the inquiry has to, has to address. We are, as we know, um, going to lose Longanet power station uh, shortly. It might even be within the next year, uh, which accounts for 20% of Scotland's electricity generating capacity. As matters currently stand, we're due to lose Hunterston and Torness by 2023. <clears throat> that represents another 35% of Scotland's generating capacity. Um, so within eight years, we could lose 55% of capacity. Uh, the question we really got to address is, should we be concerned by that? Uh, if not, why not? And if so, what do we need to do about it now? I'll start with you, In Professor minute. Harrison. <clears throat> OK. Um, well, I think the, the main issue here is that, per se, you don't have to have generation located in Scotland of, of, a, th of a thermal nature if you have sufficient transmission capacity to import it. So you don't, you don't need it uh, if your network operates properly and if everything else works fine. Uh, the problem that might arise is, is cases, uh, as some of the evidence of Scottish, Parish, uh, so Scottish Power and National Grid has shown, is that you have other things going on and you have a range of different technical requirements in addition to do you have enough capacity that you've got to uh, ensure you actually can operate the grid effectively. So I think in terms of uh, lots of generation closing I think you would um, if you're comfortable with that then you could probably cope assuming there is sufficient thermal generation in the rest of the UK to cope with um, uh, the inevitable um, swings in wind. Uh, my own personal view is that you should retain something. Uh, it provides you with a degree of, uh, degree of flexibility uh, that you wouldn't otherwise have. Thank you for being very succinct. Professor McInnes. Um, yeah, I, I would uh, agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I think if we're seeing a, um, a real drop-off of potentially 55% of capacity within eight years, and we do nothing to put in place measures which at least gets some thermal plant uh, into the Scottish grid, then we're looking at a position whereby we're entirely dependent on uh, importing the output of thermal plant from south of the border. And um, all of this presumes, as um, the previous witness has said, that, um, that the, uh, the, the, the network south of the border is secure and has the spare capacity uh, to deliver into Scotland. Uh, at times when the wind speed uh, fall to zero, uh, as it does for uh, sometimes many days at a time during periods of high demand um, in winter. My, my concern is that overall, the UK system, there's no clarity in terms of responsibility for security of supply, so it becomes um, that much more difficult um, for Scotland to uh, ensure its own security of supply if we were to depend entirely on the rest of the UK for thermal generation, which I think would be a, a pretty grave mistake. Professor Bell. Yeah, um, I think there are definitely challenges. Um, there are technical challenges. There are cost challenges in delivering a decarbonised energy system. It's not just, of course, about electricity. Um, in terms of whether the regulatory and market environment is, uh, is correct to make sure that the correct responses are made to these challenges, my view is that, broadly speaking, they are. Um, I wouldn't quite agree with what Colin said about lack of responsibility. Um, there was a bit of a grey area for quite a long time, I think, about the generation capacity margin, but the capacity market does a lot to uh, counteract that, and it's you know, gone round the first round of auctions for that, seemingly successfully. We hope that it will all be delivered uh, for 2018. There's obviously a bit of a hiatus in between. But there is also, I think it's important to note, a statutory responsibility on the three transmission companies, network companies, to comply with a security and quality of supply standard. So what that means is that the capacity market is designed to ensure there is enough generation capacity for GB as a whole, and then the network standard is designed to ensure that any area of GB has access to it, both 
in terms of facilitation of competition for energy supply across a year and in terms of reliability of supply, security of supply, if you like. So for me, then, the, you know, the, those broad bits of the framework are in place. It's a question of how they are interpreted and whether they could be clarified further, which I feel they could, um, and, and whether the, especially the transmission licensees responsible for delivering on that, whether we feel that they are uh, taking that forward in a timely manner. Thank you. Dr. Owens. Um, I'm going to pretty much agree with my colleagues so far. Uh, I think we, we see this very much as a GB electricity system. This is speaking on security of the electricity supply. Um, obviously, uh, it requires uh, sufficient transmission services, and that's an area that I think other colleagues would know a great deal more than, than I would. Uh, I think the capacity mechanism hopefully will ensure sufficient capacity comes on in a timely manner, uh, but we only have had one round, so it'll be very interesting to see how that, that develops and evolves from, from here. I, I think in the time frame that you're looking at, it's unlikely that the, the demand profile will change largely, uh, significantly, uh, that we won't get too much sort of uh, transport or, or heat. Uh, transferred to the electricity system, so you understand that side of it as well, so you've got a bit more chance to, to, to sort of plan and understand the amount of capacity you need. Uh, but I think the other thing that we, the, uh, the academy that we saw was really important is the need to bring investment through, to have that certainty in the, in the, the market conditions and the, and the political conditions going forward so that the, there is the confidence uh, to, to bring through the, the pretty massive investment that is required to, to evolve our system as it, as it moves forward. Uh, so I think that, that's the one thing that's really important. Okay. Professor Arbin. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I'm uh, certainly not going to disagree as far as electricity is concerned, but I uh, probably will uh, in general, because it's not about electricity, as we've stressed in our uh, several of our reports. Uh, uh, electricity in Scotland amounts to 19% of our total energy demand. Um, the truly tragic thing about Long Anet is not that we have... Uh, we will be losing 2,400 megawatts of electrical power, but that we've been wasting twice that much heat energy by heating up the fifth or fourth over the past 40 years. And uh, that is serious. And looking at electricity in isolation is what got us into this mess. It for sure won't get us out of the mess. Uh, and I think we need to look at security of supply at the 80% of our energy that comes from fossil fuels and will continue to come from fossil fuels in the heat and transport sectors. Uh, uh, and that uh, the electricity sector in Scotland has never been entirely dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, the other two are pretty much entirely dependent on fossil fuels. And I think unless we broaden the, um, uh, the, uh, the question and start looking at combined heat and power plants in particular, um, uh, I think we're just storing up enormous problems for ourselves. Uh, as far as the uh, electrical issues are concerned, I agree with my colleagues, but I think we need to, to, to look at it on a much broader basis. Okay, thank you. Mr. Riley. Um, so I, I think the, the, the context is incredibly important. Um, security of supply in Scotland does need to be seen, uh, considered in, in, a, in a GB context, and, and the GB system is increasingly part uh, of a wider European one. Um, across these markets, we're trying to resolve the, the energy trilemma, so um, ensuring security of supply, reducing carbon emissions, and ensuring that unnecessary costs aren't passed on to consumers. Um, National Grid, as the uh, party with responsibility for ensuring supply meets demand, in conjunction with the transmission owners, have assessed uh, the, the, the system and uh, taking any actions re required to ensure that, that uh, security of supply can be maintained now and, and uh, further into the future. Um, but there are some areas where I think um, Scotland uh, could perhaps strengthen its, its position, um, and that, that includes uh, continued investment and delivery of transmission assets, um, particularly the West Coast interconnector. Um, also, evaluating where storage and demand-side response can add value to the system, um, and identifying any regulatory or, or, or any, any commercial barriers to uh, the uptake of, of these 
uh, technologies. And, and finally, it's ensuring that the recent reforms to the electricity market in the capacity market and contract for difference uh, do what they set out to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr Owens. Well, it's hard to disagree with anything that's been said around the table so far. Um, if we're going to lose 55 per cent of our, our generation, and that's dispatchable generation, this generation that we can switch on and off when it suits us, we're going to be left with a big problem because of intermittency unless we can mitigate that uh, and have backup thermal generation of one form or another. If we choose not to have it in Scotland, that's going to have a very um, positive effect on our, our headline emission levels, but we're really just displacing those emissions to England. So it's really whether you take a, the opinion that this is a Scottish issue or whether it's a UK issue. Um, things are going to change over the next seven or eight years as well in that I expect electric vehicles will start to expand over that period. That provides a demand side management opportunity. And just last week, Tesla um, launched a new product, which is essentially a home energy storage system in the form of a, a compact battery. And these things will have an, will in, introduce new opportunities so that we can make more of intermittent sources. But in the end, when we have a high pressure system in the middle of the winter, our grid will be stressed. We will need to find energy from somewhere, and Engl the English renewables will also be stressed at the same time. So that gives us a big problem in supplying ourselves with reliable energy at the time that we need it most. Thank you. Uh, Mr Galloway. Um, yep, a lot of moving parts, as, as, as several folks have already said. Um, in terms of electricity production capacity, certainly um, we're increasingly operating within a, a wider EU market, as Michael says. Um, transmission investment will be key uh, and keeping the, the foot down on that. Um, interconnection will increasingly play a role in the GB market context. There's probably between four and 5,000 megawatts of new interconnection, which can play a role in security of supply. Um, energy efficiency has a big part to play. Um, we've seen reductions of peak demand in Scotland and indeed in the UK of um, somewhere in the region of 20% over the last seven or eight years. So that's clearly relevant. And then we've got um, heat and, and transport, as, as Ian and others have said. I think what we do about it, I think I'd probably highlight to four things ultimately in terms of the electricity side it's national grid's main responsibility and they've got um we would assess all of the tools they need to ensure the lights do stay on um the four things i would maybe point to um as i say making sure we've got um timely and sufficient investment in transmission assets um maximizing the generation we can have in Scotland, and that probably means um, continuing um, to develop um, low-cost um, onshore wind production. Um, thirdly, I think we need to start a serious debate about energy storage and um, technologies like pump storage uh, and how um, those technologies can help balance the system and provide much-needed flexibility. And then finally, just making sure that the, the GB mechanisms we do have, such as the, the capacity mechanism, are working as well as they can be, and um, the procurement right, and we're buying enough capacity um, to meet the challenges ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr Slade. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think agreeing pretty much with, with everyone that's gone before, um, but... Some, some points I would raise. I think, again, it's very important that we look at this, geographically speaking, in a, in a whole GB market. And when you're looking at security supply, you're looking at um, across the sort of the level of interconnectedness amongst the whole of GB, but also just building on the point from, from Mike and others that around the, the level of interconnectedness that we're looking at from near Europe, from Norway, etc., over time, which will obviously feed in but then also how they impact the commerciality of current investment into GB. So I think that's a, a positive that needs further investigation. I think yeah, we've said that capacity margins um, are tightening and we've seen that coming. But I think it's also worth noting that we do have one of the most secure systems um, within Europe at the moment. And certainly from, as has been said, from National Grid's responsibility, we're confident that they have the tools and the resources available to them to uh, to deliver security supply over the coming years. 
I think it's very, very important, though, that after the work that's gone into delivering EMR, that it's given us a certain amount of time to bed in. Um, rushing change at this point would send the wrong messages out to the investor communities. It may require tweaking. I don't think anyone would necessarily disagree with that. But let's monitor it and let's make sure it's delivering before we make any rash changes and make sure it's working from a whole market perspective in terms of what it's ultimately delivering. Um, <clears throat> A couple of people have touched on um, DSR and energy efficiency, and I have no doubt in my mind that uh, demand-side management reduction, energy efficiency, have tremendous parts to play over the coming years. Um, improvement of housing stock, but also let's not look at, let's not forget about how we can improve energy efficiency of businesses as well. There's been a lot of concentration on the domestic market. We also need to look at how businesses can improve their efficiency. And I think just to agree with Brian, I think the whole area of storage uh, in a multitude of different technologies is something that uh, we know a lot about in some respects currently. There are also a lot of unknowns as we go into the future. Thank you. Well, that's been very helpful. Thank you for that. I mean, it seems to me we have a quite astonishing degree of consensus around the table around some of the big issues, unless I'm, I'm mischaracterising the responses uh, we had. And, and this view seems to be, if I can summarise, is that we, we don't have a crisis. We're not facing a crisis. But in the longer term, Scotland will be reliant upon imports from elsewhere if we don't replace some of our existing thermal capacity. That seems to be the message we're getting. And there's other issues brought up around... Uh, issues around heat, around transport, around transmission, uh, storage, energy efficiency. The one thing I don't think anybody mentioned was affordability and the impact on bills. Maybe that's something we can get into um, in due course. But just before, I'm going to bring in Dennis Robertson as Deputy Commissioner just in a second, but before I do that, I just wanted to follow up uh, on one issue because um, we've had a submission, I'm sure some of you will have seen, um, a submission from WWF who've produced this Pathways to Power report, which basically argues that by 2030, we could get to a situation where we needed no thermal plant in Scotland. We could rely purely on renewables and interconnection. And I just wondered if anybody had a view on that briefly, whether they thought that was a realistic or indeed a desirable scenario. Yeah. Um, I about. would want to study the system behaviour first to reassure myself that it can be worked dynamically. So, you know, we know it's a, a, an electricity system is, is complex, it's non-linear, it's dynamic, it changes all the time. There are particular challenges around, uh, people talk a lot about the kind of loss of inertia. So it's a stored energy that's there that's very useful for managing short-term changes. So that's one of the things that would need to be uh, examined very carefully. It's part of the transmission company's responsibility to do that. So one has to trust that they will get on and do that. But um, it's not trivial. But okay, there's some time to get there and to check that it does work. But I don't think it's quite as easy as just to say, well, of course it's going to be okay. Engineers are used to solving problems, so they should solve the problem and it should be okay. But the resources need to be put at it to make sure that it really is. And if necessary, find creative solutions to it. And there, there are ideas out there. Professor McInnes? Uh, yeah, just to kind of comment, comment on the, that, that particular report. Um, I mean, it, it takes a kind of a rather narrow view of electricity in the future, in the, the, the starting point is for Scotland to be. 100% renewable, um, rather than having electricity which is affordable, um, secure, and is increasingly low carbon. Um, and if we if we look at, for example, um, back to 2012, if we sum up the the low carbon contributions in Scotland, if we sum up um, nuclear, um, wind, hydro, and the other renewables, then we're exceeding our domestic consumption. So by the Scottish Government's metrics of looking at the domestic consumption as the, as the starting point, um, we can argue that Scotland actually is um, low carbon just now and has been for several years. But the issue is that we're losing um, roughly you know, 17 terawatts of uh, electrical output um, each year from um, Hunters and Torness come 2023 if they both close them, which I'm pretty sure Torness will be going on into the 2030s. But... Um, um, to me, at least, the whole reason we're talking about security of supply is because we're at the starting point of zero nuclear and maximising renewables, rather than taking a systems level view, which is optimising for, for, for cost, security of supply and um, increasingly low carbon. So I, I would very much caution on the WWF report because it takes a, a very narrow starting point for um, electricity supply in Scotland. OK. 
Okay. Dr. Walker. Yeah. I'll just back that up and actually support what Professor Arben said. You know, electricity is only a small part, and 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 uh, and the one that is actually the easiest to to decarbonise as well, uh, transport and, and heat being, uh, as he said, almost entirely fossil fuel based. Um, I'd also back up what Professor Bell said: is that that uh, there are many more. Uh, sort of characteristics and, and functions that, that different en electricity supply uh, and generation types have. I think the one the one word that was mentioned a few times as we went around the table is flexibility, and that's one thing that's not necessarily rewarded in the current market structures at the minute. Uh, and and things like inertia, things like voltage control, uh, reactive power. Uh, engineers are very uh, sort of intelligent and innovative people. We will find solutions to these things, but it will take time, uh, and and they need to be given time uh, to to sort of find this, the the optimum solutions, particularly as you you merge the the sort of heat transport and, and electricity sectors together. And it's not it's a, a not a very non-trivial task that they have. So be ambitious, yes, absolutely, but but be realistic as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've we've heard three views very similar. Does anybody take a, a contrary view? Who wants to express an opinion? Okay. Right. I'll I'll bring in Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Uh, I wonder if we just expand maybe some of the discussion around the uh, flexibility and interdependency uh, within the network. Um, I think from what the evidence we've heard uh, and the initial discussion this morning, there is this interdependency and Scotland is not standing alone um, and there's a great reliability on the GB. But we've also heard that um, there's this possibility of a European Union in terms of an energy union. And I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of domestic investment, that domestic within the sort of GB, is this going to be um, diverted and because maybe the European market is uh, uh, at maybe a better place for the investment? Um, and I'm just wondering, does this in, uh, flexibility and reliability of secure uh, security of supply in the future going to be more reliant upon the interconnection with Europe rather than our own domestic um, interconnection and obviously uh, supply uh, and I think the second question, if I may convene it, would be uh, regarding the security of supply. The one thing, and I think it was Professor Bell that uh, put this in his submission, was in terms of the workforce. Do we have the skilled workforce to ensure the security of supply for the future? Professor Bell, do you want to start off with that then? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as I said in my submission, I do have some concerns about uh, the through flow, not just of professional engineers, uh, but also of uh, skilled craftspeople, fitters, technicians, um, you know, the kind of smart grid in inverted commas, uh, which includes things like demand side management, demand side response, and so on, all sorts of other technologies. Yeah, it brings some challenges there. Um, a lot of the industry talks about the need for skills and, and the shortage of engineers. There was something on... on um, I think it was on, today, on the Today programme this morning, actually, just on that subject. But in my experience of working with a number of companies in the electricity sector, at least, it seems to be a bit... Um, uh, uh, the commitment seems to be wavering from one year to the next, you know, depending on exactly what last year's results were. So, um, yeah, I think that's a big subject in itself. In respect of Europe and the European interactions, um, there's, there are studies that say that, you know, for European consumers, then to kind of um, share security of supply or share reserve capacity across Europe saves uh, a hell of a lot of money. I, I can't remember the exact numbers I've seen in one study, but, you know, hundreds of millions of euros per, even per year. But, of course, there's a political dimension to that about the reliance on capacity from another, another country. And we can see that, uh, you know, DEC has gone for a capacity market in Britain, the French have gone for their own capacity market, and the European Commission has gone into print as saying, well, we don't like that. We don't think that's actually in consumers, European consumers' best interest in terms of the affordability. Um, so, yeah, there's just some, some, some choices to be, to be made there. Um, uh, there was some other th thing that you raised I was going to pick up, but I forgot what it was right now, but let others go. <laughs> it was the issue about, about skills and the workforce. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I mean, yeah. skills and workforce, definitely I think there's an issue... Um, there are initiatives going on. I kind of, I've, you know, to be honest with you, I feel a bit frustrated that the 
the kind of the talk is not always matched to my mind by parts of the industry in terms of commitment to graduate recruitment and apprenticeships and so on. It seems to kind of come and go a little bit. Does anybody else want to specifically comment on, on, on either of these questions about the European grid or, or workforce? If not, I've got plenty of other members want to come in. I'm sure we can develop these points. Um, yeah, Professor Arvin. Just, just briefly on um, uh, uh, sk the skills issue. Uh, speaking as someone who's from an industrial background um, rather than academic, uh, I I've uh, grappled with this problem in Scotland for... 30 years now, uh, uh, and the, the problem is that uh, private companies can only take on as many people as they can afford, and if, they are, if we are to take on um, apprentices, graduates, uh, and so on, we have to see a future for them uh, to be able to afford them. Um, I mean, universities and colleges churning them out is one thing, but having a market for them uh, afterwards is another thing, and uh, now working in academia as I do, I, I'm constantly uh, concerned about the number of people leaving universities who haven't got jobs in this needed profession to go to. So it's a much bigger issue than just looking at, uh, at uh, providing people with the skills. We need to have the d demand for the skills. Okay, Dr. Walker. On the skills thing, the Royal Academy of Engineering recognises that across all sectors. Uh, I mean, industry is telling us that, that the, the, they need, uh, they need the, the people at all levels as well, from technicians. So um, uh, hopefully the job prospects are there, but it, it's, it's, again, it's a, it's a huge issue and something that we're trying to, to coordinate quite a, a major effort in is what impact this is going to have on the future of security of supply. If I, I'm not sure I mean, I've heard from anyone that, that, that they, they feel actual services or actual sort of investment is in, 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 at risk immediately. It's, it's more of a long-term issue. That is to, to date, mo most employers yeah. have been able to find the staff from somewhere and, and the, the sufficient skills, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that that will continue. I was going to say another bit on, on the interconnector side of things. When we, when we were... When we were looking at the, the sort of capacity margin, and if you look at Ofgem's capacity assessment reports, the, 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 the role of interconnectors is one of the big uncertainties in it because they are fairly, in, if you look at the, the France uh, GB link, it's an entirely separate entity that basically flows whichever way the, the, the price signals tell it. Uh, what no one was really able to say is in times of stress, whether you could actually rely on the connector to, to either provide energy or just simply be a, at least not be taking any away. So that, we probably need to look a bit more at the, the, the market conditions that, that oversee the, the connectors that are basically just point-to-point -point, uh, commercial arrangements. Okay. Uh, Mr Galloway, I think you want to come in on the skills yeah. question. Uh, just to go back to Mr Robertson's original point about investment in the European context, I think uh, three things I would say is one, um, companies do what they're good at. So, for example, um, Scottish Power in the UK was spending a lot um, more than we've ever spent on energy infrastructure. And that goes into areas we are strong in renewables and distribution and transmission networks. So that's that's the first point. And there's no sign that that investment is dropping off, um, certainly at the moment. Secondly, um, member states do what they're good at and should look to capitalise on the areas of natural advantage. So for Scotland, that has a read across to onshore renewables and making sure we, we keep the focus on that. But even if we address those two points, we're still going to need some local um, solutions around storage and flexibility. And, and ideally, I think we probably would prefer um, some thermal plant alongside intermittent renewables, but I think the investment story is still reasonably robust. Okay. Professor Bell, did you want to come back? In? Yeah, I think that was uh, that the investment point from Europe. There were two perspectives on this. I do remember speaking with some, some people from Germany just only a few years ago who were expressing exactly the same concerns about how a more integrated European energy market would draw investment away from Germany towards Britain. Uh, so it does depend a bit on how the markets work, but you know, a commission perspective on it, for example, is that there's all this fantastic renewable resource in the British Isles, wind, wave, tidal, that they believe should be 
um, realised and exploited to the benefit of European consumers and meeting European climate targets. Of course, you know, there were good solar resources towards the south of Europe and, and so on. So from their viewpoint, it's about optimising where which resources are where and how you get access to them, which requires network investment. And that's one of the bigger challenges, uh, just about get, getting planning and revealing the mechanisms to, to reveal the need and the level of investment, or alternatively storage. And, you know, the point being made by a couple of people uh, that, you know, well, firstly, it is still very expensive. Normally speaking, networks are cheaper at the moment, but storage gives you some other things and some te storage technologies, the costs are coming down. But, or maybe more fundamentally, coming back to within a GB context, um, there's a few people expressing concerns that the market mechanisms that we have might not be cro quite revealing the need for storage and rewarding investment in the way that arguably it should. Now, I haven't thought about it enough to tell you exactly what way it should go, but um, you know, there seems to be a recognition that there is a question to be asked there. Um, and there was another point about skills, for, specifically for security of supply, you know, and the kind of technical challenges around that. Um, I think there were some very particular technical challenges. My perspective as someone who works with the network companies, both as a kind of educator and as a researcher, my own personal view is that um, I'm not sure the technical expertise has quite been replaced over the last few years. But that's a personal view. I've discussed it with you know senior people in people like National Grid who don't agree with me. So you know. Okay. Dr. Owens, you want to come in and I need to get some members in, but Dr. Owens. Yes, yeah, sure. A couple of points I'd like to make. The one is to return to the skills, possible skills shortage. Under another hat, I'm a director of recruitment for the School of Energy, Geoscience, Infrastructure and Society at Heriot Watt. So I'm intimately involved in the recruitment of students at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, the job prospects for our engineering graduates are extremely positive. The petroleum engineers in particular fly out the door, although obviously changes in oil price might modify that in the future. Um, but civil engineers, structural engineers, many of them go off to work in the en energy industry and the employment rate is very high. Where we have trouble recruiting students is into the postgraduate market to do e specialist MSCs. Uh, the numbers can be disappointingly low, but um, last year, the SFC uh, introduced some scholarships which enabled us to essentially double the numbers on some of our courses, the courses or programmes related to energy skills. So by supporting postgraduate study, I think you could certainly upskill uh, the workforce with an immediate effect. Um, just a, an issue about costs as well. Storage is expensive. Uh, in December, I was at a conference in Australia to talk about storage and uh, Particularly, they were interested in photovoltaics. And in Australia, they now think that photovoltaic energy is competitive with gas fired generation. But when you add storage into the mix because it doesn't, the sun doesn't shine at night, doesn't shine in the middle of a, a thunderstorm, you double the price. So someone has to pay for that. And in the end, it is the consumer. So we have to bear in mind that um, we have to keep in mind the people who pay disproportionately more for this tend to be the poor um, and we can't fail to notice that that can, will have an effect in the long run on their energy bills. Thank you. Okay, I've got a whole lot of members that want to come in. What I think I'll do is I'll, I'll take three members initially and just get points uh, or questions and then we'll go back around some of the panellists and see how we go on. The start with Gordon MacDonald. Convener. I wanted to go back to the opening remarks um, made by Professor Harrison that um, seem to have general agreement around the table, and that was, if I picked, picked you up correctly, that we might not need to have additional thermal capacity in Scotland, uh, and we can be dependent on the rest of the UK. Um, my understanding of the situation is that the derated capacity margin for the UK is 4%, that the interconnector from France and Netherlands is running at capacity importing electricity into the UK. The numbers that I've seen for England's consumption of electricity of 266,000 gigawatt hours is that it's dependent for 10% of that need from imports from Scotland, Wales and mainland Europe. So my question is, on, is really where is this um, electricity supply going to come from if we don't build the base load capacity in Scotland? We'll just hold that thought for a moment. Um, Lewis MacDonald. 
A couple of questions, Convener, uh, first of which is, is related to Gordon's. Uh, the market, market uh, capacity mechanisms are designed, so as I think Gordon said, so that capacity in, in GB doesn't fall below 5%, but clearly it can fall to that level. And I guess my, my, the, the first thing I'm interested in is what is, is, is there not a, a real risk that what we'll actually end up with a position of is not the lights going out, but at times when uh, renewables are not uh, generating, uh, that we'll get a position where, 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 where the market, because they're market mechanisms, effectively the way that power is uh, rationed will be on price and the consumers will still be able to put the lights on, but the cost of doing that um, will peak in, in ways that, that, that are unacceptable. Uh, in, in relation to the European context, which people have talked about, uh, clearly we're a, a long, long way from a European uh, electricity system on the, uh, uh, compatible with the GB system. But even when we get there, a lot of the weather patterns, climate uh, change and weather patterns that are being predicted for, for these islands are also predicted for much of Northern Europe. And uh, the same question, I suppose, but on a European scale, is the ultimate outcome of that not that you you you, you turn to a a a, a, a coal producing plant in Poland, for example, since we have Polish visitors, to to meet low supply from renewables in Great Britain, mm -hmm. and the consequence and, and therefore what is the what is the price effect first of all in consumers, and what's what's the climate benefit of that, and and my other question, which is I, I suppose a, a different one. But, but uh, I think uh, Alan, uh, uh, sorry, Edward referred to photovoltaics in Australia. Um, we have a, a renewables mix for electricity generation, which is very largely dependent on wind. Should we not be looking more at other sources such as solar uh, and uh, the potential that they have uh, and trying to grow not just a diversity between uh, uh, low carbon and, and other sources, but a diversity within the renewable a group of uh, generating potential as well. Okay, and uh, Chick Brody. Yes, thank you. Uh, some of it, good morning. Uh, some of it, uh, the things I wanted to ask were about European interconnection because not only do we have, just looking at the risk assessment, not only do we have a potential political problem uh, with, with Europe, but we also have a, a technical problem. For example, uh, as has been mentioned, the Northern Ireland connector is, 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 uh, has much reduced technical capacity because of, of, of failure in the cables. And nothing uh, says that cable connection will be secure from Netherlands, Belgium, or what have you. The other question I have in, in relating to, to this is, is investment, which has been mentioned. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Walker mentioned that we need pretty massive investment. Uh, the National Grid, as we know, is a private company. Uh, and although it made £3.7 billion pounds of operating profit in the last financial year, is increasingly investing in New York, Massachusetts and what have you. I mean, how do you feel or do you feel secure about the opportunities for investment, which some of us would like to see very much more in renewables, etc.? I mean, how do you feel about the availability of investment, uh, given that Europe will have to look at its own investment? Our national grid is increasingly investing elsewhere. Uh, do you see that as a risk in terms of longer uh, term supply? Okay, thank you. I'm going to start with Professor Harrison, just if I can just summarise, that, just remind you of the, the questions, because I'm quite keen to get different views on them. Uh, Gordon McDonald's first question really was around, is there sufficient UK capacity? Are we not hitting, hitting peak uh, and, and hitting the, you know, the prospect of, of, of brownouts? Um, uh, Louis McDonald asking this about also the, the impact on the European market where all European countries are facing the same challenges as us. So, you know, does interconnection actually solve much if we interconnect with the rest of Europe or do we not end up just importing uh, coal produced electricity uh, from uh, Poland? Uh, also, question about the price to consumer uh, if we're relying on uh, renewables, uh, which uh, if they're not at peak, does that drive the price up? Question about uh, from Lewis also about um, whether other technol other renewable technologies might be better than focusing purely on wind, such as such as solar, in terms of spreading the load. Is there too much focus just on the one technology? And and Mr. Brody's uh, question uh, also about um, 
uh, capacity interconnection, but also about the question of investment. Are we confident that we'll see the investment here in the UK as opposed to uh, competition from elsewhere? So lots to think about. Professor Harrison, you can start. Thank off. you. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll try and pick up these in. in, in in, in, in some sort of order. I'm not sure whether it's a logical one. I'll pick up the baseline one first. I mean, in, in ignoring things like um, the issue of voltage control and, and stability and, and inertia, uh, as long as you have enough transmission and the transmission links between different parts of the country are strong enough, it doesn't really matter where the, where the generation is, ultimately. It doesn't matter from that point of view. Um, where it starts to matter is where you have limitations on the on the network, which which is true. So I mean, it, it does exist, and there are limitations within Scotland uh, across the Scottish English border and, and further south. So the the challenge there is what would incentivise a thermal generator to locate in Scotland as opposed to Northern England or the south of England, and so on. And that, that maybe pick up later on on some of the issues around. Um, locational pricing and co connection pricing for this. So I, th I think the, the issue there is is if if it's purely on price, then there's no logic to doing it. If there is something about security, then you have to have a connection. If you're unable to rely on other flexibility options, and we, we've heard quite a few of those. And I think the issue here is to what extent can you rely on demand side management, storage, and, and interconnection elsewhere outside the UK to replace for thermal generation. That's the, that's the ultimate thing. At the moment, we don't have a huge amount of experience about demand-side response beyond the, the what ex already exists in terms of interruptible contracts and triads. Um, if we can rely on those, then we can do a lot. Um, and there's a lot of proving that needs to be done at distribution level and, and also at transmission level. Um, the, uh, the issue of the EU, if you like, synchronisation of, of, of wind and the rest, there is certainly there is spatial synchronisation. Um, the smaller area you look, the more likely you are to have high correlations between the output of wind here and here. Um, the bigger the area, the, the, less light, the, the, the less correlated they are. But there is still some correlation, and you can have uh, relatively rare um, atmospheric conditions such that you get relatively still conditions over much of northern Europe. It's not completely still, but it, it happened. But it is rare. So this really takes you down to the crux of the issue about, uh, about renewables, is what do you do when the wind doesn't blow? And uh, you can operate with a mixed system, which you then burn fossil fuels, or you can move much further, which is essentially what we're being mandated to do, uh, where, you have, where you rely on renewables for most of the time, but you have other for when the wind doesn't blow, and I think I, I don't see it. As, I don't think there's an inherent contradiction in that. Uh, it's, it's a matter of do you want to pay for fuel or do you want to pay for capacity, and I think that's probably the issue. That's probably I, I can go on, but I think maybe less. Yeah, well, fine. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. You'd be very helpful. Just just uh, addressing some of the points. Uh, who else would like to come in? I'll start. Well, Mr. Slade, you can start. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. Um, just to add to, to some of those points and and pick up. Someone mentioned uh, resilience in specifically and I think it's interesting to note that uh, looking at the UK as a whole in terms of its thermal capacity um, over the period from December 13 to February 14 which is the last numbers I've got in terms of winter performance um, the actual loss from thermal capacity unplanned was actually less than 0.3 percent in terms of the total context for, for GB capacity so I think it's important when we, we look at these things the plant that is running across GB, whether it's wherever it's based, is actually very, very resilient and is there when it's needed. So I think that that's something we all need to understand going forward. I think to pick up on um, the affordability point and how all of this works and the European context of this, we have raised concerns ourselves around um, the viability of European interconnectors and just exactly what they will offer from the GB perspective, from the Scottish perspective, in terms of where the flows are governed, how the flows respond to market signals, etc. So I think these are all very, very important pieces. And as an association, we're actually undertaking a fairly large piece of work looking at the role of interconnectors in the market, which we'd be quite happy to share with uh, the committee at a later date, uh, one that's published later on this year. Just, I think, a, a final point we've, we've touched on, and um, you mentioned the affordability issue, that that hasn't really come up. I think as an industry, uh, as a Scottish government, and as a, a sort of 
the European community. We need to address the issue of expense behind all of these services and these new generations. There's no doubt that renewables and wind in particular are making tremendously valuable contributions, but we need to make sure everyone understands the costs associated with those and how they will actually be paid for over the longer term. And I think ultimately you can't ignore when you're looking at security supply issues, when you're looking at uh, the trilemma of affordability, sustainability and security, you can't ignore energy efficiency and ultimately as a development of that you can't ignore um, demand side response unless you're dealing with the energy efficiency of your housing stock of your building stock you are not actually solving the root causes of some of the fuel poverty problems we face thank you mr galloway yeah. when we look across the different aspects of the four questions around generation and investment and the role of markets and affordability i think there's there's two key questions one is around have we got the pace of the transition right and that's quite a difficult question to answer so basically the rate of closure of coal and older gas plant is that being adequately matched by investment in new gas plant new renewables, new nuclear, and an interconnection to piece all of this together. And I think at the moment there seems to be comfort that that, is, that, that assessment um, is, is right. National Grid have a role, DEC and Ofgem and others have a role. And I think um, the, there's transparency around how that is assessed and, and we'll continue to evaluate that uh, on an annual basis. Second question around markets is, can the capacity mechanisms deliver? And clearly, we've we've got the the early stages of the GB capacity mechanism, which has gone well, uh, and and we would want to see that continue. At the same time, other member states are, are uh, grappling with these problems and looking to introduce their own capacity markets, and that gets into the the wider European context of how we can mesh these markets together, because that is not going to be very simple. There are a, a whole host of different market arrangements, taxes and levies that are inconsistent across member states, and it's going to take time to make all of that work. Ultimately, procuring capacity has a cost. Scarcity has a value. So there will be an impact on consumers. At the moment, that impact is relatively modest, um, but we, we, we need to see how that goes as it plays out in a wider European context. Okay. Uh, I wonder if something you could pick up directly Gordon's point about UK, UK. Yeah, well, Professor Bell, yes, please. Yeah, um, capacity margins have historically been some kind of metric for um, just is there enough generation to meet the peak demand? Uh, the you know, derated capacity margin is another variation on that. Mm. And you're right, you know, some of the national grid scenarios suggest that in the next couple of years they're, they're getting small. Yeah. But, of course, the question to ask then is, well, how small is small? And w at what point do you start squealing that it's too small? Mm. And uh, the approach that DEC and national grid between them have taken in respect of the capacity market is to measure things in terms of loss of load expectation, which I think Professor Harrison has maybe talked to you about. Um, which is a bit more of a precise measure on that. And they have to choose a particular threshold and say, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. Supposedly, that's been informed by some economic analysis. By coincidence or otherwise, it's the same threshold they have in France. Um, and, you know, the capacity mechanism, as we've already talked about, is supposed to deliver that from 2018. That's when those first contracts take effect. So, of course, there's a question about what happens in the interim. So, National Grid would tell you, and you can get them in and they'll tell you directly, I'm they're, sure. They're coming. Yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> that they've got some things in place to manage the transition. So they've got a thing called supplemental balancing reserve, which they believe is going to work. A, a valid question to ask of them, and has been asked, is about the place of uh, demand-side management in that. And is that being undervalued? But as Professor Harrison has said, you know that has to be proven. National Grid, I think, are taking a cautious approach. Some would say overly cautious approach to accommodating that and comparing it with, with generation capacity in that market. But, yeah, it's a valid question to ask them when you get them in about what happens in the interim between now and the introduction of the capacity market. But my judgment would be that the threshold is uh, set for that market is not too low. Okay. Dr. Rollins? Um, well, the subject of demand side management was mentioned several times, and I do have some experience of that. Um, so let me just say something about it at this point. 
Um, domestic management can be as simple as being a participatory process. If you provide people with information about the availability of green energy, then those who are motivated by an environmental issues are likely to modify their behaviour. That um, is a very low-cost solution. It's not a, probably not a big solution, but it could have an impact on peak demand. Uh, we've demonstrated that. My own research group have demonstrated that recently at the Findorn community in Morayshire. It has had a, a measurable effect. And since March, we've also been, been varying the price of electricity to the participants. Um, so essentially rewarding people for changing their behaviour. This takes a form of charging 17 pence for a kilowatt hour at periods when the wind isn't blowing, down to 5 pence when the wind is blowing. And we recognise that there's going to be a surplus of demand. That has had a very measurable effect. People are twice as likely now to use a washing machine when the wind is blowing than they were prior to us starting that experiment. It's very cheap to roll out at a national level. What it is going to take, though, is a change in the way that we sell electricity. Yeah, a new business model is needed that recognises this new future we have with intermittent generation. The smart meter rollout provides an opportunity yeah. because we can then measure electricity use on an hour-by-hour -hour basis and reward people for participating. Which, this, uh, this is the point Mr MacDonald was asking about, about yeah. the impact on build. Can I just go back to, to Professor, what Professor Bell said, because in response to Gordon MacDonald's point, Professor Bell said, if I, if I noted this correctly, that in your view the capacity margin set by National Grid was not too low. Does anybody disagree with that? Right, okay. <laughs> okay, right. It's, yes, Dr. Walker. Just, just to, to, to follow up on that and, and the, the point on, yes, we do, we do need to move to, if, once we get smart meters in, the, the possibility uh, of many more tariff systems, although uh, sort of fellows we have that have worked in, in uh, retail side of things said that they've struggled at times to get a third tariff. They, they sort of worked at times with the normal tariff, Economy 7, tried to bring in a, a third one, and they said it was just a real struggle to, to get the consumer buy-in for, for that. Uh, but at the minute, we have, you know, we have fixed uh, sort of tariffs for, for a long time. Uh, the spikes you see do, do occur, but they occur in the wholesale market, and there, there does seem to be a bit of a fear of these spikes uh, uh, sort of uh, occurring, which is in a sense why, why the capacity me mechanism came in. But actually the spikes are the market uh, functioning the way it ought to be. And as long as the spikes are only very narrow, the, the, the cost of the overall system isn't significant because it's the area under the curve, not the, the height of it, that, that's uh, uh, important. Uh, so I think we have to, uh, yeah, the, the, once we move to smart meters, the possibilities become uh, much greater. But at the minute, I think we, we shouldn't be uh, scared of those spikes to actually indicate where, where investment is needed. Uh, in terms of global investment, in terms of national grid uh, investing overseas, you'll have to ask them. I'm sure they'll have very good reasons that they'll tell you. Uh, one of the reasons might well be that they actually get to, to, to play in, in different grids uh, and, and much smarter grids that are happening in, in the States and actually learn lessons from that. But in terms of overall investment, there, there is, uh, I'd have to look it up, I can't remember if it was KPMG or someone uh, who have rankings for, for uh, sort of how the GB is seen in comparison to other countries for investment. It has suffered a little bit in recent years, as EMR was going through and there was certain uncertainty and with, with election, it dropped one or two places in, cer in some uh, sectors, but it's still re seen as a reasonably good mar market to do business in. And, and as long as we can keep that, that sort of political certainty uh, as, uh, uh, and uh, the sort of, as, as somebody said, bed in EMR and let's see how it works. Uh, then hopefully the investment come, and the investment has to come from new places, from hedge funds, from pension funds. Uh, so they need to to understand how these new mechanisms work and to, to sort of uh, de-risk them a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we haven't heard from Professor Arben for a while, so I'll bring him in. First. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, very difficult to disagree with uh, what my colleagues have been saying, but uh, I just want to go back to what I said right at the beginning, that I feel that we are trying to address a very large problem from uh, the end of the viewpoint of the smallest component, which is electricity. Um, and unless we take a truly 
systems view of, of energy. I don't see how we can resolve these problems. Um, unfortunately, we've spent a lot of time talking about EMR, but EMR is a classic example of the problem in that it is electricity market reform, which pretty much ignores everything else. Uh, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It means it's, it's ignoring 80% of the market. Um, and security of supply applies to 100% of the market. Uh, uh, and uh, I, 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 th I feel there's a, a grave danger of just going down the route that we have always done before in the UK um, and in Scotland, uh, and the opposite of, say, the systems thinking that they have in Denmark, for example, where uh, all forms of energy are considered as part of an integrated whole, and government legislation, therefore, reflects that, and they have a very desirable situation. Um, uh, heat energy is by far our biggest uh, area of demand in Scotland, uh, and just to, um, to give you uh, advice, uh, there's a new IMAC -E heat energy report coming out in the next few weeks, so, uh, uh, and uh, we do consider the situation in Scotland in that. Um, uh, but that, that's part of what I wanted to say. The other thing is, uh, on we, we talk a great deal about uh, affordability, um, and yet we don't seem to uh, we, we don't seem to look at how our energy is produced in the UK, and electricity in particular uh, is still predominantly produced in, in, in very old power stations, which are sunk assets. Once we get round to uh, replacing those, those thermal power stations one way or another, um, their replacements are likely to cost an awful lot more. Uh, and so we, we, we need to have a realistic uh, view of cost. Of course, we, none of us want uh, costs to escalate, but we have to pay for what we do. Uh, and this became very apparent to us while we were doing the energy storage report. Uh, the, it'd be very difficult ever to make a, a financial case for energy storage, but we don't see how the system works without it. Uh, and that's the kind of real dilemma that we have to, we have to face. Thank you. Okay, I've got other members who want to come in. I just want to, before I do that, though, I want there's, there's one issue that nobody's responded to, which is Lewis MacDonald's issue about renewables in Scotland. Are we putting too much emphasis on wind, or should we be looking at a broader mix? Professor McInnes, do you want to come in? I think we need to attempt to the mix. Um, if you have to choose a, a one renewable technology for Scotland, then it, it, it will be onshore, onshore wind. It is the, the, the lowest levelised cost, um, certainly compared to, uh, to solar um, at our latitudes. Um, if you look at the other European countries' experiences, um, in Germany, where they've had a really big push for, um, for solar, and we get these, these spikes of very high, very high output, um, you know, midday on uh, you know, sunny spring or summer's days. But um, I mean, the, the net result overall in Germany, I believe, is that investment is something like 300 billion. Um, results in about 5% of electricity from solar, which corresponds to about 1% of total energy. And as, he, as Ian says, the electricity is just one slice of the, the total energy budget. Um, so if Scotland's going to push renewable energy, then um, onshore wind is the, is the one to push. Um, my concerns, I think I've expressed earlier on, um, is having an appropriate mix of energy sources. And just now we have a mix of uh, nuclear um, some fossil fuel, hydro and wind. And you know, I, th I think we're kind of skirting around the issue actually security supply. What we're really talking about the fact is that we're closing down all of the thermal plant uh, if we do nothing else. And that, that's, that's the transition. It's not a transition necessarily to, to, to low carbon because um, hunters and turnrests produce copious mm -hmm. low carbon um, electrical energy. We're talking about a reconfiguration of our energy supply from one which is dependable to one which is intermittent and, we're, and we're storage interconnection are all the things we're trying to build around that to make essentially a square peg fit in a round hole. And we can talk about investments in storage or investments in uh, interconnection capacity, but it's a cost. And that, that cost is borne by the consumer, either directly through electricity bills or indirectly through the increased cost to, to business, which are passed on to consumers. So I'm not against renewable energy uh, at all, but I, I, I do worry 
um, that were over-egging um, onshore wind to the long-term detriment to affordable um, electrical energy, not just in Scotland, but, um, but UK-wide. And, and if we, again, if we, if, we, if we strengthen the interconnection to elsewhere in the UK, the UK strengthens the interconnection into Europe, um, you know, the buck has to stop somewhere. Yeah, um, we, we do need... Uh, <laughs> It needs large scale thermal uh, generation somewhere in the grid. It doesn't matter how smart your smart grid is, you still have to put joules of energy into it somewhere. Can I yeah. pick up a couple of those things? I mean, the, the issue of cost is, is obviously very important, but the, and the, the key thing is that all of the costs and decisions we make on that basis, invariably people are reducing it to how much it costs per, pen, uh, per pence per kilowatt hours. If you actually look at the evidence on it, by and large, they're all roughly the same. You're just paying in different ways. Nuclear costs, in its capital cost, its fuel costs are modest. Wind is almost all capital cost. Uh, Gas-fired is almost exclusively um, fuel. And there are uncertainties associated with those. So actually, it really is, there's an enormous, enormous sense there of, well, which one do you pick? Well, the answer is you, you can't really pick one on a single basis. But you, if you go down the, the gas route, you're guaranteeing yourself fossil emissions. Nuclear, um, I'm reasonably agnostic about nuclear. But I think the, the important bit here is that it doesn't matter which one you pick or which ones you pick, it's going to cost you. And I think that's one of the things that we haven't really dealt with properly is that there's supposedly a ma there's no magic bullet to this. And reduction in energy consumption is critical and it's always left behind it's not sexy uh, it's hard to do um and it, it really is the one you want you, you you really need to focus on uh because if you can if you can reduce your energy consumption everything else gets disproportionately easier uh even the balancing and bringing in the uh the chp if you do it in a, in a, in a, in a sensible way it becomes much more straightforward Oh, yeah, it'd be fair, like, I'm come back. Before I, I, mean, I think we're, we're getting to the different levelised costs of energy and, and systems costs. And my, my concern is that we're, we're thinking about levelised costs. So the you know, pence per kilowatt hour from you know, wind, gas, nuclear. Um, and in fact, they, they're not representative of the total system cost because if you're building in storage um, interconnection capacity, and it's the, the, the total system cost which has to be paid for. Um, somehow, and I think the, the levelised costs are, are very misleading because if you're trying to compare base load nuclear with intermittent wind, which requires either storage, connection, or gas plant backup, then that, that's that's a pretty big uh, hit on top of the just just the, uh, the levelised cost at the that, at the substation. So. Okay, so I mean, one of the interesting bits is if you actually look at the studies that that look at that and say there isn't a huge amount of difference between them. You're simply paying in different forms. Um, I mean, the obvious thing here, I mean, it's picking up on Ian's point about the, there isn't a business case for, so, for, for, um, for storage. There is a business case on a system level, and that's why, uh, that's why people built 400 kilovolt lines across <coughs> North Wales and, and built, uh, built the Norwich. There was no real need to do it, but it was there to support the nukes, because there was seen to be a strategic need to uh, allow the nukes to operate uh, during periods of low demand in the summer, and that, that's why. So it's actually the, 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 the way the market operates is, you, you, you mi in some respects, it misses the point. Um, and I think that's the, is that's the issue, and it, it really comes down to where, where you're moving to next, is you need to think holistically. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think we agree. Yeah, I think just to kind of support what Professor Harrison has just said, you know, and there are studies come which which do try to address the whole system cost in electricity context and to include the cost of operating the system. Um, I think as Professor Harrison has just implied, and I think I'll pick up as well, you know, something that Professor Arben was saying about, um, you know, the, the, the particular market mechanisms, this applies particularly to storage, might not be there to, to drive the investment that from a whole system point of view looks most economic. So that's got to be a specific challenge. And, you know, Professor Arben is absolutely right about heat as being a huge challenge. Now, you know, I think as Dr. Walker said earlier, electrification of heat looks like one kind of viable option. So, and, and decarbonisation of electricity is something that we are already doing. So that's part of the reason why we think we're going down this road. But, um, okay, I'm daring to step outside of my specialist subject here. I'm not an economist, but something that struck me very strongly at All Energy last week in various discussions about decarbonisation of heat and about district heating and combined heat and power was really that the um, the investment model 
didn't seem to be there. Uh, you know, we look at it was a lot of case studies from Scandinavia, which seemed to be sort of municipal investment or government investment where the, the investment could be, could be recovered over a long period of time in a way that private sector investment perhaps wasn't able to tolerate. I mean, you know, maybe Professor Arben can expand on that with more knowledge than I have. I'm just, I'm just going to, thinking as everybody's talking about whole system models, I thought it was interesting, and some of you might be aware of this, on the Public Contract Scotland website on Monday... Uh, there was published a tender notice for a whole system energy model for Scotland uh, by the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor of the Scottish Government, wishing to commission a model of the energy system in Scotland, including all processes or investments carrying the potential to impact upon the level of greenhouse gas emissions or removals in Scotland to stimulate investment decisions, etc., etc., etc. The model and any scenario supplied with it will be robust underpinned by research evidence and capable of standing up to challenge from the academic community and other stakeholders. So there's a piece of work you might want to tender for. Uh, Monday, published on Monday. I can maybe comment on that. That seems yes. very interesting because that uh, looks like a, a reissue of a tender that came out a few months ago. So maybe they've failed to identify a preferred bidder. <laughs> no, nobody had the expertise to do it. Um, I mean, I, w I, was, I was involved in a few discussions about with people who were thinking of tendering for it and who seemed to be the front runners. Um, it seemed like, actually to me, given the amount of money that was on offer and the period of time, it seemed hugely ambitious was my first view. So if you didn't already have something that already met the, 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 you know, the requirement, you were going to struggle to deliver it. Uh, what I will say as well, though, is that there are various initiatives across the UK in trying to do whole energy system modelling. So a lot of those have been commissioned through the UK Energy Research Centre, of which I'm, I'm since the last May a co-director. Um, um, coming out, for example, from, from University College London, who I know are some of the people that the Scottish Government was talking to about some of this capability. Um, there's, there's another kind of research council-funded consortium of people to try and develop tools and facilities to get that kind of capability. So I, I think there, is, there are, from my perspective, I think some of the capability needs to be developed further. It's maybe a bit crude in some aspects of the whole energy system and incredibly detailed in other aspects. But um, you know, the, people do attempt to do it, but it's good that there is a recognition of the whole energy system importance of electricity and heat and transport. Thank you. Yes, Dr Walker. I, th I think that's absolutely right, but actually the, the reality of applying these sort of uh, engineering solutions in, in, in the real world doesn't always match with the models. So, so I think the politicians have to understand that as well, that what your models and scenarios are saying are not necessarily what will happen in real life. One of the things we're calling for is much broader demonstration uh, sort of community level whole system so that you do bring in and start to understand how the electricity and the heat and the, the transport system could interact together uh, particularly once actual users uh, uh, and sort of customers behavior is taken into, into account and the different sort of uh, sort of uh, billing mechanisms that might, might be used. So actually moving from the, the sort of theoretical modelling to the real world, there's, there's very often a, a sort of a, a sort of big discrepancies that we really need to understand because uh, uh, Professor Arm's absolutely right, we do get sucked into the electricity system a bit too much and actually understanding how all these systems uh, will work in a truly sort of sustainable low carbon way is, is not really understood yet. It's, 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 um, uh, the, we think we know how it's going to work, but, but in reality it, it could be a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, so the real world applications are, are really important. Okay. Thank you. Right, I've got three more members who want to come in, so we'll, we'll just do what we did last time and take, take each in turn. Start with uh, Joan McAlpin. Convener. Yeah, I was interested in the exchange of views between uh, Professor uh, McInnes and Professor Harrison. Um, Professor McInnes, you, you talk about um, you know, the onshore wind is cheap, but obviously there are added costs when it comes to storage. And I noticed that from Scottish Power's submission, um, talks about the potential of cheap onshore wind in, in Scotland um, with 130 megawatts of waiting planning and another 800 megawatts um, um, potential for on onshore wind, but it, it, it strikes me, as, as Professor Harrison said, there are costs to every form of, of, of generation, and it seems to me that those costs can be distorted by political decisions, politically driven decisions. Um, so to accept that onshore wind is cheap, but we need to invest in storage, 
I just wondered what people's view was of the Conservative manifesto, um, which uh, makes it very clear that the UK Conservative government doesn't want to see uh, the development of any more onshore wind and how that might potentially distort the market. Well, to be fair, what it says is that subsidies will be removed by 2020. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me convener, a different I, issue. I was directing my uh, question to the witnesses. Just correct a, fa a, factual, a factual point I was correcting, that was all. Um, okay, uh, Richard Lyle. Oh, oh sorry, I, I thought uh, uh, Joan's question was going to be asked. Well, I think we'll do, we'll do, we'll do last time, take, take okay, a number of questions um, together and we'll come back. Well, just a comment and, and then a couple of questions uh, to, to Lauren Slade. Um, you know, the point for, for a number of years, Scotland's been a, a net exporter. That, that's the point. The Scottish Power always used to tell me when I was a councillor, uh, exporting uh, things. So we're up from a, to a record of 28% of generation. My concern is, is, is all the things shut or, or are taken away, you know, we rely on England, and dare I say it, no, no disrespect, they're having problems also. Uh, and you don't rely on your next door neighbour to pay your bills, so I think to rely on England we could actually face a problem. But to go on to Mr Slade's, you're on about energy efficiency, renewables, etc. Uh, during the election going round, seen a number of houses, quite a number of houses now have solar panels on the roofs, you know, for for uh, you know, to reduce the electricity consumption. Do you think we should encourage uh, new housing stock totally when they're building? to have solar panel and when council now are upgrading houses, I know I know we're talking about insulation, etc., but that only works to a certain degree. Should we now encourage councils to uh, upgrade their um, council housing? And the same also, I think Mr uh, Owens was on about the fact of that uh, where we're, we're encouraging people not to throw litter on the road, uh, we should be encouraging people to reduce their electricity consumption uh, in ways that, uh, for instance, low energy bulbs, but the cost of low energy bulbs is, you know, you're talking about £5 a bulb. Uh, could we encourage people to, or encourage manufacturers to reduce the costs? Okay. All right, hold that thought and I'll bring in Patrick Harvey. Thank you, uh, convener. See, my problem is every part of this conversation is sparking up another 15 questions <laughs> and I, I want to ask them all, but I'm going to try and pin it down to two which I think are related. Um, on, on, in terms of managing demand and reducing demand, and I, I, I say this uh, um, particularly in terms of what Ian says about thinking about the whole energy system, I think this relates certainly to heat but also to transport. We, we don't talk about transport policy and transport planning in terms of managing energy demand, and, and we really should. Uh, we're going to have to increasingly do that if we electrify, but we should be doing it now anyway. It seems to me there's a whole host of, of both behaviours and technologies uh, that are emerging in relation to energy demand, which are going to determine whether we're successful in, in addressing the, 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 the all three aspects of this trilemma. And the behavioural aspects that Dr Owens was talking about uh, in, in his uh, experience at Benthorn, I dream of the day when the whole of our society has the level of environmental consciousness of the Pendhorn community. But we've got a hill to climb to, to get there. Uh, I mean, that's a dramatic level of, of buy-in compared with where our society's at. But also in terms of smart grid, in terms of storage, uh, distributed generation and so on. What is the role of government, governments plural, in ensuring that this happens, rather than just trying to set up market signals and hoping that they play out well, which they're not always doing at the moment. What is the, the responsibility of government to uh, plan and direct this kind of transformation rather than simply leaving it to the market? And are we doing enough to ensure that these different areas of transformation result in good quality lasting jobs, a wider economic benefit for a country like Scotland, rather than seeing us import batteries from Tesla in the way that we're importing turbines from uh, other European countries that stole a march on us. And related to that, the second aspect, uh, in terms of what uh, Mr Galloway talked about, the, the rate of change, uh, we're losing certain kinds of generating capacity and we're seeing investment come, but not necessarily at the right rate. Again, this relates to this question about the, 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 the division of responsibilities between governments uh, to make decisions to plan that, that transformation uh, and the 
the, to me, rather unfortunate situation is simply set, trying to set up market conditions and see if they play out. It may be that people will respond by saying we wouldn't start from here, but we're stuck with it. But I would be interested uh, in the responses to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've got uh, a range of questions, and um, we've got Joe McAlphin's questions about uh, the future of uh, onshore wind and the question of relative cost. Uh, Richard Lyle's points about uh, do we want to just rely on imports? Should we not have our own capacity here in Scotland? And the points about energy efficiency and new housing stock um, and, and lighting. And Patrick Harvey's questions about firstly on the on the role of government and secondly the rate of change. Um, Professor McInnes, do you want to start off on the onshore wind point, seeing as that was addressed? <coughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just so I'm not misunderstood, I'm not saying that onshore wind um, is cheap. I'm saying it is the cheapest of the renewables which Scotland has at hand just now. Um, compared particularly to uh, wave and tidal, which we've seen have uh, had troubles in trying to develop on a really kind of commercial and, and industrial scale. Um, so my, my comment is directed to the fact that if, if you're choosing a renewable technology, um, which Scotland can develop, then onshore wind is certainly is the cheapest. My concern, though, is that the fact that we're we're, we're, we're focusing so much on renewable energy in Scotland uh, to the detriment of the thermal power plant generation, which is, the, I guess, the, the, the purpose of the, um, the discussion and security of supply. So we're, the transformation we're going, the transformation we're doing is we're, we're, we're transforming our low carbon nuclear, which is a, a huge component to um, our electrical energy output, and we're replacing that, which is base loads and reliable, dependable, 24-7, and we're replacing that with intermittent wind. And that, that, that's, that's my concern, is that we're swapping one, one for the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't want this to be an ideological discussion about thermal ver versus renewable. Uh, this, this committee has taken evidence to show that because of the regulations being set at UK level, even if we wanted to build a thermal plant, it would not be um, cost effective for, for the generators. Um, we might not even get a, a new gas plant. So that, that's, a, that's a problem with regulation. We also heard from Professor Harrison last week, I thought it was very interesting when he was briefing us that a country like Germany, which has you know, a big investment in renewables uses thermals as a backup in, you know, for, for the times when there is a, a crisis. Um, but we can't do that here in Scotland, despite, you know, the opportunities for renewables, because the way the electricity market has been set out by the UK government means that we can't, we can't operate a thermal plant. Well, that, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the political challenge, is yeah. to have the conditions whereby um, there, there is good, good grounds for investment yeah. uh, in new thermal power plants. So this isn't Scotland. about the Scottish Government favouring yeah. renewables over thermal, this is about the UK Government's regulatory system. Well, but it's, it's, it's also a position we've taken whereby the, the starting point of the discussion is, is no new nuclear in Scotland. Now, whether the, the, the framework is there for that to happen in the future is, is an open question due to the, the, the market conditions. But in terms of a, a political starting point, we're, we're basing the discussion around there will be no new nuclear build in Scotland. And so we're then having to fill the very large gap, which would be left in Hunterson and eventually Turnes come offline. We're having to fill that something, and we're trying to fill that gap with intermittent wind uh, alone. That, that, that's, that's, that's my concern sure. for the future. Well, and what do you think then, obviously, the, the the UK government's gone down a different road with nuclear and it's investing. I think the, the, the subsidy for Hinkley will be £35 billion. Now, we, have, we, we could address some of our intermittency problems by investing in storage, um, but we can't do that because, again, because of the way the market's set up. Um, you know, like, I, I would imagine um, the, the subsidy would, would be considerably less to invest in, uh, in storage, and I'd be interested maybe what Scottish Power thought of that. Um, but again, the way the UK system set up, I believe for political reasons, um, it favours investment in, in nuclear or um, uh, subsidy for nuclear over subsidy for, for storage, which would be quicker here. Uh, we could have a policy, um, you know, uh, road to Damascus conversion to nuclear tomorrow, but it wouldn't solve the immediate problem. What would solve the immediate problem is given the go-ahead to the pump storage systems that, that we, we could go ahead with quickly if there was a different regulatory system at the UK level. If I could just briefly respond to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean comparing storage and uh, you know, basically with thermal generation, I mean, you're comparing very, very, very different beasts. So, for example, for pump storage, where typically you're providing storage for a, a, a matter of hours, um, where in fact, uh, you know, during winter periods of high demand, you could have you know, many days at a time uh, of almost kind of zero wind speed across Scotland, the UK, and uh, sometimes across much of Western Europe. But 
in terms of the nuclear issue, I mean, if you're again in terms of you're thinking long term, uh, is the new investment in nuclear to the south. Um, they were a design life of something like 60 years, It'll probably run for, for for more than that. Whereas wind has a design life of 20, 25 years. So the investments to the south are very, very long term, extremely long term. Potentially, the new nuclear plants to the south will be producing low carbon, reliable energy right out to the end of the 21st century. Um, whereas uh, our very significant investments in onshore wind uh, are much more short term. And coming back to the, the question of what do we do in the future due to the relatively short design life of, of wind relative to nuclear. But, but that's a, I guess a, bigger, a, bigger, a bigger question to discuss. Okay. Okay. Professor Bell wants to come in. There's always a discussion that you can have with kind of companies or policy makers or whatever about whether something's a conspiracy or a cock up and you know whatever the motivation was for UK policy but and you know UK Treasury and DEC and Ofgem of course can speak for themselves my understanding is that what's motivated certainly for Ofgem's part the regulatory and market arrangements that we have in place uh, at the moment is lowest cost of energy for GB consumers now you know whether it delivers an answer that you happen to agree with or not that's what they've intended to do and you know there is always a need to review the mechanisms that are in place and to change them if we think they're not actually working in the way we intended. And storage and the role of storage and how it's valued in the market arrangements, I think, is one example where it, it is you know time to review that and think about that quite quite carefully. Um, there was a point where I think Mr. Lyle made the point about you know England has got all sorts of trouble. Why are we relying on them? Uh, England doesn't have all sorts of trouble. There's the usual suspects that like to get out in the press every autumn when National Grid publish their uh, winter outlook and say, oh, it's a disaster, the lights are going to go out. But actually, while you can never say never, there is always a risk and there's always an economic balance to be struck about how much you're going to pay for additional reliability. By international standards, it's not in crisis. And we've already talked about electricity market reform and the capacity market and what it's supposed to do. It seems to be kind of the first round of auctions seems to have been successful. We see how it gets delivered. In the meantime, uh, you know, you can ask National Grid about what they're doing and supplemental balancing reserves and various services like that. But my understanding, speaking as an engineer, is that the risks are not excessive for GB as a whole and that the regulatory levers are in place to ensure that, uh, at, at least at a bulk level, at a transmission level, consumers in Scotland do have access to electrical energy available, you know, if it's available in England, they have access to it to give a sufficient reliability of supply. I have to think the network bits could be clearer and could be better articulated. I think there are things that are kind of missed in the way they were written, but broadly speaking, they're in the right direction. Uh, but of course, people's experience of reliability of supply also depends on distribution networks, and there are other particular challenges around that as well. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think... Uh, you know, relying on England when England are in crisis, I don't think that's a fair assessment of the actual situation. However, as we've said already in this discussion, go beyond 2020. There are bigger challenges, and yes, we, we, it's absolutely right to be asking questions. Okay. Do you have any other pick? Oh, well, lots of people want to come in. Right. Mr. Risley, you've been very quiet so far. Yes, if, if, I, could, um, if I could just perhaps start on the, the point on, on onshore winds, uh, probably not surprisingly. Um, I mean, ju just to say, onshore wind is, is the, the, the cheapest form of renewables generation um, and the outcome of the, the, the CFD auction has, has shown the, the competitive advantage that, that Scotland has in delivering that technology. Um, I think re removing support for onshore wind would, would appear contrary to the, the process of electricity market reform that we've gone through in creating a, a competitive allocation of, of support for, for these technologies. Um, there, was a, there was a point made about encouraging people to um, to lower energy consumption. And um, there's been a lot of talk about demand side re response as well. And I think those two things can actually go hand in hand. Um, the, there's uh, a very good example in uh, benefits to uh, communities in, in, uh, in uh, creating a more active uh, response or active um, involvement in, in uh, responding to, to, to price signals. And, um, I think smart meters, uh, the rollout of smart meters is, is one step in that, that transition, but uh, smart tariffs have to go uh, hand in hand with that. And um, yes, I think now is, is, a, is a very good time to start having that discussion, opening that discussion as to is the regulatory framework right in allowing uh, uh, us to, to, to 
accrue those benefits. And um, that also includes identifying where these uh, things can add most value. That There's a number of ways that demand-side response could evolve uh, across the network, either at a very aggregated level or at a much more localised level. Um, so I think we need to be thinking now about how, how we can make it uh, work for, for our consumers. There's an interesting conundrum, isn't there? Because on the one hand, there's huge pressure for power companies from consumer groups to simplify the tariff structure. And you're talking about actually going in the opposite direction. It, it, it is an interesting uh, conundrum. Um, I think, yes, th th there needs to be simpler tariffs. Uh, well, <laughs> the, 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 I guess the question is, do we need fewer simpler tariffs or more simpler tariffs? <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't have the answer. It's, it's a, a question that I think needs to be, to be opened and, and, and considered. Okay. Professor Arbin first. Uh, yeah, listening to the conversation, I'm uh, reminded that 40-odd years ago I started out my career um, supplying what we would now call biomass-fired CHP plants um, to various countries around the world, manufactured in the UK but not sold in the UK. Uh, uh, and so we've had that expertise for an awful long time. And the one word that has been missing from the conversation so far has been biomass. Uh, now, biomass is renewable. It's, uh, it jolly well should be sustainable, uh, it would do it properly. Uh, it's dispatchable in electrical terms, and it's thermal, so we can provide heat energy from it. Um, uh, seems to tick all the boxes, yet ignored. Um, uh, it also lends itself ideally to um, distributed systems rather than looking at, uh, uh, at the global um, network system, uh, which, from my experience, seems to be a direction in which we want to head, um, although it's, it's fraught with difficulties. Um, a simple solution uh, to a lot of the supply-side issues could be in biomass-fired and waste-fired CHP plants, uh, and I certainly commend that. Um, I certainly support what has also been said about uh, uh, energy efficiency, and perhaps a decade ago, uh, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers produced something called the energy hierarchy, which uh, uh, I know I've spoken about before in this building, um, which looks at uh, not just at energy efficiency, which is a bit of a catch-all phrase, but looking at uh, the first tier of energy conservation and the second of energy efficiency, um, looking at those before we look at different um, supply side uh, possibilities. And I, I think uh, I just wanted to say that in support of, uh, of what others have been saying around the table. But it's not that we haven't known this for a long time, uh, and, and it seems to be the right way to start. So those two points. Okay. Um, Mr Slate? Thank you. Uh, to respond to, to Mr. Lyle in particular, um, I mean, I think we tend to look at this more as a as a geographical market and a geographical network, and I think that's been you know, a lot of people here this morning have have said similar things. So it's it's not so much looking at as as England and Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. It's more this is a a, a whole market and it's a whole system approach across the geographical area. So I think in terms of the whole reliability and whether you rely on it, you rely on the whole system and you rely on investment into the whole system and you rely on the system having an appropriate mix of generation sources on it to be able to securely supply consumers up and down the whole region. So I think that that's the first point which I think has been reflected on um, this morning. I think what's what's key with that though is that you make sure you have the frameworks in place to ensure that from a company's point of view, you have the long-term investment certainty to continue investing in the networks and continue to invest in capacity. And those are the signals that are absolutely essential over the next decade or more to be able to say, I know that I can get a return from investing in X market and that will help deliver the security and deliver the, the electricity that's actually needed. So that is key, which is why I said earlier that we need to ensure that EMR is given time to bed down, that we monitor it, but we actually just let it bed down and tweak rather than significant changes on that front. On energy efficiency, um, 
I think it's been said that it's not a sexy subject. It's not a subject that's spoken about um, in the evening. But it's actually a very, very important subject. And one of the ways round this is to actually change the story. You're talking about waste. You're not talking about saving energy. You're talking about stopping wasting energy. You're talking about stopping wasting money. These things play out stronger with consumers than, than other arguments. It's also telling a story about how it doesn't, limit your quality of life how it improves your lifestyle these are different messages which we've all got to get better at communicating if people are really going to buy into this it's also worth remembering that there are other advantages around getting people warm healthy homes and it's maybe slightly off topic but there is a significant saving further down the line that increasing number of studies are showing that if you fix fuel poverty if you give people healthy homes there is a significant cost benefit around the health service, which is obviously of vital importance at this time on budget. So there is a lot we can do there, but there's a lot of extra things we need to do. In terms of what we should be doing with new homes, yes, I think we can do a lot more in terms of what uh, new homes in terms of, are, are built with in terms of energy efficiency products, whether it's solar, etc. That's a different body that looks at that, that's building regulations, a different area, but pressure needs to be put on there. But I think there's also a valid conversation around what you do with public subsidy. So whether it's paid from general taxation or whether it's carried on the energy bill, what you do with that, how transparent that money is spent and how it's targeted is absolutely vital. But also, what is the able to pay market and how is that incentivized? You don't want to be subsidising someone who can afford to put solar panels on their roof themselves. You want the subsidy to be going to people who can't afford to improve the quality of their home. So those are really important parts that uh, the Scottish Government needs to be looking at and indeed are on that. Just on smart meters, uh, which has come up a few times now, it's worth noting that there are several live studies uh, across GB uh, where there are very, very clear indications that with the right communications, the right comms with the consumer, you are seeing demand shift and you are seeing demand reductions off the back of uh, smart meters being installed. The point that Mike was making earlier, I think is very key, it's how you communicate that usage and that change to the consumers. And there are examples from California, from Australia, and nearer field from the Netherlands, where that communication hasn't been done properly and you've seen a massive sort of negative opinion around smart and it's very 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 important that before we move down a time of use tariff uh, approach that consumers understand how this will work and where they can benefit from it thanks um, mr galloway and then dr owens uh, uh, two points one from Ms. McAlpine and one from uh, mr harvey in terms of um First of all, investment models, and I said earlier that companies um, tend to do what they're good at, but they also do what markets allow them to do in terms of um, meeting demand or, or price discovery or ultimately profit. Um, on the electricity side, um, the, a combination of policies and regulation seems to be providing a large part of the solution, and electricity market reform is a good example of that um, in terms of bringing forward low carbon generation, notwithstanding some of the political challenges around onshore wind um, that were mentioned. Um, I think those mechanisms can also work for storage for um, tariffs and, and smarter markets and, and those sort of issues. But whether it's worthwhile assuming that the same large companies will solve all of these problems is probably um, unrealistic. I mean, we're... we're the mechanisms aren't there around um, renewable heat, alternative transport, perhaps things like community energy. I think what Mr Harvey says is right, that we probably do need to explore alternative investment models other than, rather than sort of um, seeing the outcome, being somewhat disappointed by it, and then sort of um, putting some policy statements out and setting some targets and, and hoping that, that um, delivery comes forward. So I think we do need to look differently at, at some of those questions. Um, secondly, on, on pump storage, I think key positive from today is, um, and storage in general, is starting the conversations about what needs to happen. Our, our initial view is that the technology can be cost competitive um, at large scale. But again, uh, as someone said, the question is, 
comparable with what interconnection is different, thermal generation is different, but our initial assessment is that it can exist within part of a, a solution, um, an overall system solution. I think it, it ticks the flexibility box, it certainly helps the network, it helps the decarbonisation message in terms of things like um, reducing con curtailments or, uh, from wind farms. I think siting is clearly key given the, the large environmental questions that arise in, in developments of that nature. I think the three things we need to do is, as I say, get the conversation going, build consensus as to why storage is an important part of the total energy system. Um, then we need to look at what are the barriers to investment and why um, companies cannot invest in, in that technology under the current market arrangements. And then off the back of that, think about what those market arrangements or regulatory frameworks might be. And again, very initial assessment, but um, things like the cap and floor regime that is being developed for new interconnection might be one idea where the, the cap is there to protect consumers, ensure overall cost is manageable, and the floor is there to ensure that investors don't lose their shirt. And the, hopefully the outcome is somewhere in the middle. So I think there are things we can do for, for things like storage, but some of the other um, um, areas like uh, renewable heat may need a different approach. Dr. Rollins? Yeah, well, there are several things I'd like to pick up on if you're patient with me. Um, <laughs> well, we, we have about 20 minutes left, so we're not that patient. <laughs> it shouldn't take 20 minutes, should be pleased to hear. First of all, I'd just like to, to back up what Joan McAlpin said there about thermal generation. I think it's slightly hypocritical of us ex to expect thermal plant to back up our intermittency to be built in England and not in Scotland. We're going to need it one way or another. And I often hear the, the comment that the renewables industry generates jobs in Scotland. Well, I'm sure it does, but so does thermal generation. And if we're going to rely on fossil fuels anyway, then we might as well have it in our own country. Although there will be additional connection costs, I, as I understand it, and not being a poles and wire person, I'm not an expert on that, others in the room are. Another point is about district heating schemes. 40% of our energy use is in heat and hot water for the built environment. Um, many cities around Europe have large district heating schemes, some fed by biomass boiler systems. We don't really do that in Scotland, but there is potential for us to do that, and it could make a massive impact. We're then targeting a 40% of our total energy use rather than the 25% that um, is the electricity market. And I understand in Scotland it's actually near 50% and 40%. The other thing is about the tariffs. You're right, if we bring in variable tariffs, we will complicate things. But we have a really poor record of communicating about energy to the public. Um, if you look at the interfaces we have to energy, my mother's um, in her mid-80s. She has a new boiler installed in some government incentive, and she's given a control screen the size of a matchbox which she can't read, she can't understand, and she just uses a big on and off switch. She keeps hitting buttons until she hears a boiler going on. And since she's and deaf, that's not very... <laughs> and, and since she's old and she's deaf, that's very difficult. So the interface between the systems is very important as well. We need to think about how we communicate. If we, it's particularly if demand-side management takes off, we need to do that in a smart and a graphical way so that people clearly understand it. Engineers tend to worry about numbers and little squares and, and figures, but really it's about pictures, it's about communication, and it's about ergonomics. So it's not just an engineering problem. Okay, I'll take a, a brief comment from Dr. Walker and then we need to move on. Uh, two brief comments. Uh, I think the other thing that hasn't been mentioned today other than biomass is CCS. Uh, and actually with Peter Head hopefully going ahead as one of the, the, the two yeah. schemes on that. Uh, I, I think that's a, a, we really need to find out whether that works or not, uh, how, the, how the business case works for it, how the efficiencies work. Uh, if it does work, that's another area that the, the, U, the UK and Scotland in particular could take a, a global lead on and, in terms of job creation and wealth creation. Uh, and if you actually... Uh, match it with co-firing of biomass, you can actually get negative emissions. So in terms of the climate uh, system, it could be uh, particularly useful. Uh, I will um, take a general point in terms of a lot of what has been said in terms of the message and, and the, what government can do. Government does an immense amount in terms of, of the, the, the energy system, especially even if you're just looking at 
building new homes. Uh, it's enforcing the regulations, the, the efficiency and the, 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 the sort of the standards. Uh, and, uh, you know, companies that we spoke to say, we, we wouldn't do this if government didn't tell us to, and government has to push that. But more than that, this is, uh, we have to see the energy system as, as a, a partnership between government and industry. Uh, and it's only by doing that will we be able to actually uh, sort of transmit the, the message. Uh, you know, as we've all seen, this is a complicated system that's got a lot of change to happen. And, and the more we can bring the, the consumers and the, the public along with us, the better chance we have. And that's only going to happen if there is a partnership and a joint message from government and industry. And at times, possibly, they, they, those two have, have uh, played one, uh, one another off against each other. So uh, it would be a, a bit of an appeal to, to the, the politicians here to really uh, go for the partnership with government, uh, with, with industry, in order to, to make the changes that are necessary. Okay, thanks. I'm conscious of time. We've got 15 minutes left. I've got a number of members uh, who want to come back in now. I'm going to start with Joanne Lamont, who's not had a chance to ask a question yet, and then I'll go around the others. To start okay, with given how little I know about this, it's more difficult anyway to ask a question, although I, I absolutely related to your mother. Um, <laughs> I suppose I'm interested in, I mean, I, there's a, some kind of frustration, particularly, I think, from our colleague at the end here, this sense that the conversation isn't the real conversation and that your um, reality is knocking up against public perception and, and political perception. I just wondered how we deal with that and what role do you think you as professionals have in that? I think we have grave public suspicion around anything around energy, whether it's in fracking or nuclear or, or in renewables, a public anger against the companies who feel that people feel have been ripped off. How in that context are we able to have that rational conversation that clearly people are I hear are pleading for, and what can we do about that? And, and you know, I give us an example. We know that there have been renewable proposals for wind farms in Scotland, which Scottish government have refused, and clearly have refused on the basis that public um, concern has been so strong. So, how do you hold the line on having an energy policy that's consistent with rationality, when at the same time, quite rightly, you have to respond to communities? So, how I'd be interested in your view how we deal with it. How do we stop politicians doing what? You know, maybe um, they should be doing, which is responding particularly to communities, but also recognising there's a, um, a bigger challenge here. And the second point I'd be interested in, we discussed briefly last week how, for example, if you have a tariff which recognises that people who are fuel poor are not able to use enough energy because of the charging, but if you change the charging and they then use more energy, you've kind of got yourself into the wrong place. How do you make uh, energy efficiency something that makes sense to people. My granny, many, many, many years ago, was the first in her village in Tyree to get electricity. Until the day she died, she looked out from the croft to see which, when anybody else's lights were on before she switched hers on. It was a natural thing that you saved and you didn't waste energy. How do we get back in, a more, in this world to where we actually see it's a personal thing, that you actually can control the amount of energy you use and how does the technology add to that rather than to confuse it? Okay, I'm going to take very brief points, if I can, from the other members who want to come back in. Gordon MacDonald. I have two questions, but my first one was mainly covered by Joe McAlpine. Second one is um, to do with a subject that Lewis MacDonald touched upon, which was consumers' affordability of electricity. Um, you know, on one of my more bored days, I sat and read the Eurostat pricing uh, across the EU28, and I looked at the countries that had interconnectors with the UK, France consistently has lower electricity prices in the UK, looking at the period 2011 to 2013, 15% cheaper, and they have 12% renewables as opposed to 4% for the UK. We're talking about putting an interconnector to Norway. In the period 2011 to 2013, Norwegian electricity prices have come down by 10%, at the same time as UK's prices have went up by 22%. So my question is, is the market and the pricing mechanisms in the UK working to the advantage of consumers, bearing in mind that we're told the electricity bills are going up because of renewables? All right. Um, Richard Lowe, do you, Richard, do you want to come back? Yeah, on? just to, just to correct, uh, Professor Abbon, um, I, I think really what we have to do, we have to educate the public. You know, you're on about biomass, I'm on about waste to heat, I'm on about waste to power. 
the minute you say you're going to put one of these plants anywhere within a 30 mile radius of anyone, it's like putting a nuclear uh, submarine trident beside it. You know, people don't want it, and that's the problem. I think we have we have a great job of trying to educate the public that waste of heat, biomass, and whatever is a pla uh, are plants that can be put locally and are safe. The point and that backs up the, 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 the point that Joanne Lamont made about the need for a public conversation around these issues. Dennis Robson. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, we haven't really sort of touched on it, but it, it, it's really security of supply is a long-term issue. And I'm just wondering, should we be looking at ensuring that we've got further investment in areas like uh, wave and tidal, uh, offshore wind, etc., to actually supplement the, our demand for the future, rather than sort of moving down the road of, say, nuclear or developing other um, thermal plants uh, uh, in Scotland. So, really, it is you know, are we are we really sort of stepping away from this investment, or should we be investing to actually move that technology on because it's there? Right. Okay. Elizabeth Old. The sun's still shining outside, convener, so I'm still hoping to hear an endorsement of the potential for photovoltaics right. in Scotland. <laughs> but, but in addition, uh, we heard the comment made that uh, we don't do district heating in Scotland. Actually, in Aberdeen, we have now uh, expanding in the last couple of years thousands of council tenants on combined heat and power uh, s uh, system. Uh, the, the challenge there is retrofitting uh, when people are private owners of their homes um, and I'd be very interested in any suggestions that anyone on the panel had on that issue. Okay, all right. Quite a lot of ground to cover in 10 minutes. So, uh, John Lamont's questions, we need a, need a national conversation. How do we win over public opinion? Uh, how do we simplify energy efficiency and make it more easy for people to understand? Gordon's point, why are the bills cheaper elsewhere? Um, what is, it, is that fault of our systems in this country? Dennis's point about uh, are we ignoring wave and tidal and offshore wind? Could they fill the gap? Um, rather than relying on, on a nuclear or new conventional generation and Lewis MacDonald on district heating. And, well, well, you were... <laughs> I wasn't ignoring you. I, you. You were agreeing with Joanne Lamont's point, so that can be picked up together. Right, brief response if we can, please. Professor Bell, you can right, start. Very quick one on why other countries have cheaper electricity. Uh, in France, they have uh, the benefits of investment in nuclear power, for electricity, you could ask some questions, I think, about where the accounting of the decommissioning costs appear in that. I don't know. Uh, in Norway, they have the benefits of lots of cheap hydropower. Um, I'm not sure why their bills have come down recently, but one of the things that they always are concerned about is if you're going to have... A, they, they want a wet winter, actually, or a snowy winter where you've got lots of snow melt to make sure the dams are full or the, you know, the reservoirs are full and they've got enough water for electricity, it helps them to store and manage their water supplies by having an interconnection to the Netherlands. So uh, they can keep the water back and maybe the average cost ends up coming down then so they're not so worried about running out of water and they can use surplus thermal plant in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you. Right, anybody else want to come in? Mr Slate. Um, just on how we engage customers, I think it's it's how you actually get them understanding their electricity consumption and their gas consumption if they're on the gas grid. And I think one of the things that we are seeing now is via smart and via um, graphical interfaces, be there via an in-home display or via a smartphone or via a computer, people are seeing how they're using their electricity and that is helping them understand that and their, their usage. In terms of uh, those of Paul site, uh, there is actually, I'm pleased to say, work going on about how to actually bring interfaces in. We're working with the Royal National Institute of the Blind to ensure that there's ways for people who are hard of sight to, to actually understand their consumption that way. So these things are, are being looked at, fully support the idea behind a national conversation. What we've been asking for, though, is to pick up Dr Walker's point, it's got to be some kind of partnership between government and between industry and we've got to see transparency in those discussions. Thank you. Okay. So just picking up a couple of points there. About the affordability issue between uh, us and others. Um, I mean, one of the key things about Norway and France is the role of the state in energy supply. Um, and you, one thing you will see in that is the difference in the discount rate, i.e. the cost of capital, uh, is generally much cheaper in state-owned systems than it is in, in the UK. Um, so that is one key area, and if you 
stretch that across a very long time, you get quite a big difference. Um, in terms of the public investment wave and title, uh, I have vested interest in my university, as the answer is yes. Um, I, I think, I think there are, the obvious thing here is that you, know, you have something that is has potential, um, and do you, you know, there, it is, particularly tidal, I think, is, is, is not arguably ahead now. Do you let it get to the point that we did with wind and then let it go abroad, or do you just stick with it and get on with it? I'm, I'm, but, I mean, can you answer Dennis's point specifically? I mean, will that fill the gap? Not in the immediate term, no, but then actually not very few things will fill the mm. gap. But we're looking at long term. Yeah. Well, long term, I think you can get a very substantial contribution. And I think it comes back to Lewis's original, one of the original earlier questions about um, do you get benefits from spreading that spreading around? I think the answer is yes. Um, okay. Professor McInnes. Yeah, Before you pick up on the energy efficiency, um, is a historical context, um, th this month is the 250th anniversary of James Watt inventing the separate steam condenser. So it's May 1765, where he did his insight wandering across Glasgow Green one, uh, one Sabbath morning, as he recounted to his biographer. Um, and James Watt's invention was a revolution in energy efficiency. Um, he improved the efficiency of the steam engine threefold, from 1% to 3%. And energy consumption soared of course, it kick-started the Industrial Revolution and gave us a modern prosperity and civilization, which uh, many of us enjoy. So if we're improving energy efficiency um, of consuming electronics or other devices, then we don't necessarily have to, or have to <laughs> recognize it doesn't necessarily mean we'll be using less energy uh, into the future, we'll be using it more efficiently. And energy efficiency in the past has been the mechanism through which energy consumption has been growing. Uh, through a socially progressive mass democratisation of access to energy services. Okay, thank you. Dr Walker? Uh, just to pick up, uh, I'm not sure I've got answers to some of these questions, but, but uh, absolutely agree with, uh, with the energy from waste being difficult to get planning from. It's, it's, it's tragic that uh, in terms of the, the heat networks and retrofitting. Retrofitting is another word that probably should have been mentioned a bit more in terms of the, the heat side. Uh, it's all very well new build, but the, the vast majority of our buildings that we'll be using in 2050 are already here, and it's more difficult to retrofit, but a much bigger slice of the pie. Uh, but there is a lot of work being done by people to, as to how to, to fix that, but it, it's, it's uh, hard not to crack. Mr Galloway? Uh, just an observation that everything we've spoke about this morning, with the possible exception of energy efficiency and demand reduction, has a, a cost associated with it. Much of that cost is higher than the current cost of the energy system. So that piece Lawrence mentioned about the debate on energy, the costs, the trade-offs is really, really important. And, and, and the sooner that's understood right across um, society, the better, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Rowan, yeah. uh, um, I just would like to return briefly to one point about diversity of generation. Um, diversity can mean many different things. One, it can be geographical diversity. So, wind turbine in Cornwall will experience different wind conditions from one in Shetland. So, that can mitigate the problem. We can have technological diversity. So, we can bring in PV, we can bring in biomass. Tidal, I think, is going to play an increasing role. Wave, I'm not as sure about. It's further away, for sure. And also, there's um, diversity of demand within our economy. If we have different sectors of the economy that need energy in different ways at different times, that can also help. Professor Arben. Yeah. Thank you. Just to pick up on the uh, the education point, which was mentioned by a couple of the, the speakers, um, uh, something I've uh, had a lifelong commitment to and have the scars to bear it, and I have literally been offered physical violence for speaking on behalf of energy from waste plants in Scotland. Um, uh, sometimes I sad to say I've been opposed by MSPs. Um, uh, I now teach an MSc course at the University of Glasgow on energy from waste, um, uh, and it's starting to have an effect, and I'm pleased about that. I hope you weren't threatened with physical violence from an MSP. No, I, 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 I did try to separate those two. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, I think, I think we, are, we are at the end of our time. Um, thank you to all our witnesses. I think it's been an extremely useful and informative session. I'm very grateful to you all for 
giving up your time and coming along uh, this morning to share it with us. Uh, and the committee will now suspend and go into private session. Thank you.